Welcome. Today we are beginning our second section on atheistic systems of beliefs and practices. We're going to begin by turning our attention towards India and the philosophical and religious, according to many, system of Buddhism and its attempt in overcoming the passions through noroda or detachment. What do you think of when you think of Buddhism? As our first discussion into a system of beliefs and practices to overcome the passions, Buddhism is one you're probably a little more familiar with than the others. What's your first thoughts, your first impressions, your first concerns when you hear Buddhism? Some of you, an image of inner peace comes to mind, of a, of a quiet monk sitting in meditative prayer and just peaceful. Others of you might just think of it as something mystical and or Eastern to some extent. Or commonly, some of you might think of all of the hosts of American celebrities who are all Buddhist either for a time or for longer. Some of them are good at it, some of them are bad at it, some of them are somewhere in between, right? But there's this appeal uh, to the exotic other of Buddhism for some of those more artistic in our culture, right? And, and there's this draw in and what it means to them. Others of you kind of look and think of that whole I'm sitting and meditating thing and your thoughts of Buddhism is much more just, it's boring. What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing all day? Still, some of you, the only encounter you have with Buddhism is when you go and get Chinese food or, or somewhere else, right? Southeast Asia, etc. There's the statue of the, the Chinese Buddha there. By the way, that, that man right there is, his name is Mi Lo. He was a Hopsetch monk. He is not the Buddha. He is a Buddha, but he is not the Buddha from history. He's, he's another man, a Chinese man, not Indian, uh, and is rather distinct from the Buddha that you think of. He's much more akin to Santa Claus than he is to the Buddha. He's a, a man who was enlightened and went around and giving away gifts to small children. Uh, just as St. Nicholas, the man who would become Santa Claus, was a follower of Jesus a few centuries later. Same here with Milo and Siddhartha. I and went around and, and gave out gifts to children. Same sort of idea, same argument coming out of these parallel traditions, parallel giving of things. And some of you, this is your only attachment, is, is rubbing the belly of the Buddha and, and this sort of cultural idea tied in with different foods uh, or drinks or whatever. Most of you will think of Buddhism as a religious system and are less concerned with the ethical struggle to overcome the passions of life or within Buddhism, the notion of the poisons of life. But it is primarily early on a technique in overcoming the challenges of life. And it's an ethical system, which you may or may not decide is religious, or you might not, depending on your definition of religion moving forward. The basic worldview of Buddhism grows out of the worldview of 5th century BC Northern India. Most important idea within India at this point is the notion of samsara that we all live over and over and over again, that there is a cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, that you're born, you live, you die, that you're born, you live, you die, and you're born, you live, you die over and over and over again. It's in many ways like being stuck on a carousel that you might enjoy it once or twice, but after a while, the only thought and concern you have is, ways of getting off. Buddhism addressed the reason why we're still on this cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth with the notion of karma. Karma is this sort of equation that's done at the end. It's the moral balance sheet that exists for everybody. That after you're born and you live, when you die, you've done, generally speaking, more bad than good. Well, what happens to this debt that needs to be paid, this offering that needs to be absolved? It finds another incarnation 
as it were. It goes somewhere else and is reborn. Now, actually, within Buddhism, there's no I, so there's not an incarnation. But this was the idea that existed within Hinduism. Whether or not you did your dharma, your duty. Again, there's a variation between Hinduism and Buddhism as to what is karma and some of the reasons for it. But that basic idea of did you do your duty? The duty for Buddhism is the goodness in life. And if there's still some debt that needs to be absolved, this karmic residue finds an expression in a new life. Ultimately, the goal is moksha, liberation from the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. You want off this ride. You need to find a way of making sure that your karmic output removes all of the debt from the previous actions that might have occurred let alone in this life and others. Now, there is some extra weight added within Buddhism, but this is all on top of you. There is no God for traditional Theravada Buddhism who's going to absolve you of your sins. There's no grace that can be given to you by another who has made it to moksha. And there is also no self that's going to make its way through this world that these are all actions you must do on your own and no one else can do it for you. In many ways, Buddhism is identified within the three marks of existence, anaka, dukkha, and anatta. Anatta, we've already talked about that you don't exist. There is no self. Sometimes it's also identified as anatman. Atman is the Hindu term for self. Uh, and it ties in with metaphysical ideas of Atmanit Pramin, that I am everything and everything is me, Pramanit Atman, uh, and this sort of connection. And Buddhism rejects this idea that there is no I, there is no Brahman who's there. But rather, what we have is an impermanent world, a Nika, where things go away. And part of this is the loss that exists on notions of dukkha, that life is suffering. Now, why is it that life is suffering? It's because of the poisons that exist within our very life. The three poisons, the passions, as it were, that exist within Buddhism is desire, hatred, and ignorance. The three of these often feed on one another and grow and expand and control one versus another but they're the reasons for all of the suffering that exists in our life. Our impermanent life that suffers, where we do not truly exist, are poisoned by desire, hatred, and ignorance. It's important to note, just quickly, that Buddhism wasn't the only game in town. It wasn't the only idea of trying to achieve enlightenment and escape during the time of Siddhartha Gautama. In fact, at the very same time, slightly before him, is a rival movement, another Hindu heresy, something else that rejects the system of caste, known as Jainism. Jainism is kind of a ascetic ideology that's sweeping through India uh, and is less philosophical than Buddhism, and for that reason, it was actually far more popular, even though it might not be something that's as familiar to you. Jainism is pretty simple. It followed a teacher called the Mahavira, the great leader, who abandoned everything, also a Kshatriya, like Siddhartha was, wandered around naked as a mendicant begging for food before eventually starving himself to death uh, and forging a world between this world and the next. It's fairly easy to follow if you accept the worldview of India at this time, the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. It rejects caste, so everyone can do it, including the shudras, the laborers, the lowly. You would follow, if you want to become a monk, the Mahavratas, the five great vows, which of including nonviolence. You're not violent to anything, not even to insects. You're going to tell the truth. You're not going to steal. After all, why would you want anything? You shouldn't want anything. You're going to be celibate. Again, you're a monk. 
or a, or a nun, possibly, and that uh, there's a large discussion too about women monastics of giants, of which there are some, but of only one sect. Uh, and non-attachment, non-possessions. You're going to have nothing. You're going to abandon everything. This is it. And this anyone can do. Buddhism becomes a lot more complicated. There's a lot of philosophy involved within Buddhism. Uh, and so Jainism was fairly popular and Buddhism was not. Buddhism begins during this period where Jainism is growing, where there's a challenge to the caste system, where renouncing caste seems of value. And a time when there isn't really a belief in the gods, even though they kind of exist, but they're also stuck in the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, and they live a long time, so they're not to be envied or worshipped. And it begins with the life of Siddhartha Gautama. And we have a lot of different stories about the life of Siddhartha and his birth specifically. He was born somewhere around 563 to 483 BC in northern India, Nepal. He was bo born to a Kshatriya Hindu. Kshatri is that caste of kings and warriors. Uh, his father was the king of the Sakya clan or kingdom uh, or region. And it's said that before he had many previous lives and you could read about these in what becomes known as the Jataka tales. Today, especially many Westerners approach them a little bit like Aesop's fables where there's a moral to the story and it's kind of fun to figure out who was Siddhartha. Versions of his birth uh, will say that his mother, uh, Maya, had dreams of white elephants with tusks and this signifies good luck or good fortune. It's very similar to uh, Native American plain uh, mythology that has got stories of white buffaloes or an albino buffalo that usually something fortuitous is going to come about as a result of that. It's also said, according to some accounts, that he was born out of the side of his mother and that she may not have experienced any pain. We also have other accounts that she carried him for exactly 10 lunar months and gave birth to him on a full moon in May that she was walking in the garden and was captivated by the beauty of some flowering solid trees. And she reached for a branch and uh, which bent itself down to meet her hand and the pains of childbirth came upon her. And that she delivered the child while standing and holding onto this branch. What's interesting is not just all of that, uh, but other accounts that will also say that he was born. And once he was born, he took seven steps to the north and proclaimed, I am the chief in the world. I am the best in the world. I am the first in this world. This is my last birth. There will be no further rebirth. And that he was already the size of a six month old child. Now, the size of him is only slightly remarkable. Even more remarkable is the fact that he'd be walking and talking and let alone picking a cardinal direction to do so. Newborns don't do that. But what do we learn? And if we wanna read between the lines of this, again, what is a myth? A myth is not about it being true or not true. It's about the truth behind the story, right? That, that from his birth, this was his last birth, that he was destined to not have any more birth that he was going to escape the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. Also reading between the, the lines a little bit, him being the size of a six-month-old child and being born out of the side of his mother, I mean, he probably was a C-section, cesarean. And we also know that his mother died a week later. And so that also leads to that idea because until fairly recently, C-sections meant you probably weren't long for this world. And so he was born and, and lived in a house where his mother was not there, where his father would raise him, that he would have the marks of a great man and that he was destined, so to say, from his birth to be something significant. He was named Siddhartha, which means wish fulfilled or he whose purpose is accomplished. Usually Buddhists point to the latter, although historically it probably meant more the first one. It was more along the lines of, woohoo, I have a male child, I have an heir, in all likelihood. His father, to want to know his importance, brought in wise men who looked him up and down and was going to say, all right, well, what is the idea? What is this man? What is his future going to hold? What is his destiny? 
And they said that his destiny is going to be one of two things. He's either going to fulfill his dharma as a Kshatri and become a great world conqueror, or he's going to renounce the world. His father wanted the former, but he had to choose. And so his father tried to give him a luxurious life. So he would love this life so much that he would not renounce it. His childhood would be something we would think about as luxurious. Though maybe not by today's standards, he was given every opportunity and everything by his father. His father really wanted him to love this world so much that he would avoid renouncing it. And so he had a sheltered life where he got any and everything that he would want. Although there is an interesting story that this didn't always work. It didn't seem to satisfy the young Siddhartha. There's an account of him as a, as a boy and there's a agricultural plowing festival that takes place uh, and the king was participating and, and others were as well. And everyone's kind of marveling and having fun at this plowing festival. And Siddhartha is, of course, sitting in a screened canopied couch under the cool shade of a rose apple tree to, and watched by nurses as a, as a young boy. Um, and the king is, is engaged in other pursuits. But Siddhartha is sitting there and naturally just takes on a sort of cross-legged meditative position, looking rather old as a, somebody who's studied concentration and everything else as well. And he's focusing on the plowing festival and he's not enjoying it like everybody else is, but he's sitting there going, it's hot. I'm sheltered, but the people down there are not. They're sweating. Look at the sweat of their brow. Look at the animals as they're being whipped to plow faster and they're straining against the earth. Look at the worms and other animals out of the earth getting dug up and getting baked in the sun and getting eaten and consumed. And while everyone else is having fun, Siddhartha's looking around going, this is all suffering. The fun, the enjoyment is just a facade on the suffering that is taking place for all. And no amount of his luxurious upbringing is going to take care of that. And he's continuing throughout his childhood and early adolescence to continue to have this sort of melancholy, this sort of melancholy that really only those who have time to stop and think about it can have. And only the sort of melancholy that the affluent actually get to engage in. At about the age of 16, the king turns to his wise men and he goes, my son, my son, what am I going to do with him? He always seems so unhappy and depressed. What shall we do? And the wise men all got together, go, well, he's 16, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll probably get him a wife. <laughs> and so this is exactly what happens. They end up holding a, a ceremony and they you know, bring in all of the eligible Kshatriya princesses uh, and Siddhartha goes through and he ends up picking one of them. Uh, it ends up being Yadasara, his cousin of equal age. Uh, and it's arranged and they get married. Uh, and for a while it worked. Siddhartha was happy. And this was a happy union, a happy marriage uh, at this point. It takes about 13 years and then she gets pregnant and then she ends up giving birth. Now throughout all of this time, even as a, as a young man into his 20s and near 30, uh, he still has a sheltered life. The king is still keeping him from wandering out and about from just going outside of the palace grounds. So that any time that this wanted to happen, that the king would prepare the way, that he'd clear the roads, and some stories even go so far as that wilted petals off the flowers would be plucked out. So the young prince would only see the most beautiful. And this is his life. He would have occasionally go for a walk, ask for permission, and everything was cleared out. This all changes on the day of the birth of his son. His wife is in labor and Siddhartha turns to his father and says, I want to go for a walk. Well, many of the king's attendants are helping Yadasara. They're trying to ensure, they're trying to prepare for the celebration of, of the child that is naturally going to come out as a result of that. But his father doesn't really tell him no, doesn't know how to. 
he's given him everything. He doesn't know how to say no. And so he tells him, yes, all right, take your servant, your friend, and go out. And on this day, it's important for Buddhism because he sees what's known as the four passing sights. It's what changes the trajectory of Siddhartha's life. The first thing he sees is an old man. Siddhartha turns to his friend slash servant slash servant and says, hey, what's up with that guy? He's, he's got white hair. He's making old man noises. Uh, you know, man, man, man. What's going on with that guy? And his servant says, he's old. What do you mean old? Well, he's he's been lucky enough that he has lived a full life and now he is old. And his body is beginning to break down, but he's he's been able to live this entire time. Really? Is this the only old man? No, no, no. Uh, ideally, we'd all get to that spot. Like, your father probably looked like you when you were born, and you will look like your father when your child is your age. Huh. So we all get old. Who the fuck? Goes by and goes, now that guy, I, I don't like his noises. He's, he's groaning and... It's not like the old man noises. It's something else. He goes, well, yeah, he's starving. Uh, and he goes, really? Is this, is this, why is he starving? Well, you know, there's, there's times of feasts and famine and times that we have more and times that we have less. And this man doesn't have enough. Well, I always have enough. Yeah, well, you're the prince. Like, you know, you're a little immune from some of these problems. Huh, starving. Who'd have thunk? Then he ends up seeing a dead man or a decomposing body, depending on the, the account. And he goes, now, I don't know how that guy can sleep. Well, what do you mean? Well, all of the people wailing around him, all the noise. Like, how, how is it that this man can sleep? He goes, well, he's not asleep. He's dead. What do you mean dead? We, we're all going to die. When? I don't know. All of us? Yeah. I'm going to die? Yeah, you're going to die. My, my, my child who's yet to be born or being born right now is, is going to die? Yeah. In fact, do you know where your mother's been in your life? No, where? Dead. We all die. That's that's part of life. Is that? On the way back, they encounter a wandering mendicant and, and he turns to his servant slash friend slash servant and says, what's up with this guy? He's asking for food, but he's not like the starving man. And he goes, well, this is... Somebody who's, who's renounced all of life or given up on some aspects of life and they're out trying to understand the nature of the universe and all that's within it. Is this the only man who does that? No, no, this is going to become fairly common over India over the next millennia and, and grow to be one of those stages of life that will be practiced by Hindus uh, for a thousand years afterwards. Oh, so this is available to all people. Yeah, it is. Okay. Siddhartha gets back and he hears stories that he has a son and some accounts have that he goes in and sees his son here. Others that he just slowly went over to the wall and his father's throwing a giant party for the birth of his, his grandson, Rahula. And again, this is a, this is a wild party. If you had to pick one party and to go to in fifth century BC, Northern India, this is the party to go to best singers, best food, you've got musicians, you've got dancers, beautiful women all around. And instead, Siddhartha's sitting on the wall going, people get old. People die. People get sick. Some people are starving. I'm going to get old. I'm going to die. I've never starved, but People get old. And he's just pondering these four passing sights and he ends up falling asleep. At this point, he wakes up in the middle of the night and probably an occurrence that has never happened to any of you. He wakes up after a giant party and looks around him himself and he goes, ah, what happened here? Last night, these were the most beautiful people. Now they're covered in drool and vomit. It smells horrible instead of the perfume he sensed last night. The, what were the most beautiful singers are now snoring like wild beasts. I gotta get out of here. He wakes up his servant and says, let's go. 
Some accounts have that he stops in and sees his son briefly. Others accounts that he doesn't. And he ends up waking up his, his servant and saying, we need to go. At this point, he goes out to the edge of the, the grounds uh, and he has what's known as the great renunciation. He renounces the world. He renounces his caste, his wealth, his property, possibly saying, I'll come back after I have everything figured out. He cuts his long hair, takes simple clothes. His horse even wants to go with him, but he tells him he cannot take his horse and his horse right there dies of a broken heart. So sad. He decides he needs to figure out the nature of the world, of the universe, that his life has been too sheltered that he doesn't know anything. So he, he renounces everything, the very thing his father doesn't want to do, and he joins a quest to try to understand the nature of the universe. There are many different shramanas uh, or philosophical schools that existed at this time, some of which would include notions of Jainism uh, and others of Vedanta, which uh, Hinduism will develop into that as well over the next few centuries. Uh, and he'll try philosophical speculation and sit amongst the, the most learned Brahmins, uh, teachers within Hinduism. And, and he says that it seems to be unprofitable because while they can understand or, or hypothesize about the nature of the universe, they don't know. And it doesn't seem to resolve the issues and concerns that he has. He ends up joining into a group of, of ascetics who have extreme ascetical practices. It's even said that he had gone so far to eat only one grain of rice a day. While many of you might be familiar with the Milo big fat round belly Buddha, this is a more accurate depiction where you can see his spine where his stomach would be. At one point on this quest, after seven to 13 years of trying it, depending on the accounts and stories, he's near death. He's delirious and a woman sees him and takes pity on him and she gives him food and drink and he's delirious enough that he ends up breaking his ascetical practice and he eats the food and he drinks the drink and lo and behold he discovers that he feels better not a surprise right you're starving and you eat and you feel better that that's just kind of what you should expect and now he realizes that this extreme asceticism was as unprofitable to him as his life of luxurious opulence. He ends up saying, there is a devotion to the indulgence of sense pleasures, which is low, common, the way of ordinary people, unworthy and unprofitable. And there's devotion to self-mortification, which is painful, unworthy and unprofitable. And that he needs to avoid both of these extremes and he forges what becomes known as the middle path. He says, the middle path gives knowledge, it leads to calm and to insight, to enlightenment. And this is the path that he's going to sit on and head down. It is here that Siddhartha sits underneath what's known as the Bodhi tree. And he decides he's going to stay there until he achieves enlightenment. And here he's tempted by the devil, by illusion by Maya or Mara, depending on the language that you're getting it from. And here he's tempted by the devil's daughters, the three poisons, desire, hatred, and ignorance. And he does battle with them and he, he rebuffs them. Uh, he realizes that they are vain and don't are not profitable. And after this wrestling with the devil and defeating the devil's daughters, he emerges the Buddha, the Awoken One, the one who is enlightened. Other titles that will be attached to him are the, the Sakyamuni, the sage from Sakya, or Tagatha, he who has passed through the gates of understanding. That this becomes the goal, to overcome the poisons, the vices, to overcome illusion, and to forge a middle path between these extremes. The teachings of the Buddha are summed up with what becomes known as the Four Noble Truths. The first is that life is suffering, dukkha. The second, samyara tanha, that suffering is caused by wants, attachments, cravings, and clingings. 
The third is the notion of naroda, that suffering will end when these attachments are ended. And finally, maga, the path, is the way to do so. of the Four Noble Truths is Dukkha, that life is suffering. Now, Buddhism has a fairly elaborate philosophical system explaining what it is that's suffering and why it is suffering. For instance, it's only the five aggregates of matter, as there is no notion of self. And suffering comes in different kinds, both physical and mental, as well as change and resistance to change, and is just endemic to the problem of the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. Another way of kind of addressing the issue of dukkha and suffering is that at the root of much suffering is the idea of illusions. You don't see the world around you as it is. You either see it as you want it to be, uh, or you want it just to be so much different that that is what's causing you suffering. But there's an illusion, that there's a misrepresentation, and therefore your desires along with your inability to fully understand the way things are, causes you to suffer. While many of us might not believe that life is suffering in the same way that Buddhists throughout the centuries would, because our life seems to be going fine, we can really think of other forms of suffering that we experience now and would have to agree that, yeah, it's suffering. The modern belief of progress and perfectibility of humanity is a, is a non-suffering, is an illusion. It's not real. Furthermore, we still suffer through alienation with others, while oftentimes believing falsely that relationships exist or they're better than they are as a result of social media. And so we suffer in our relations with others because it's not accurate, it's not correct. We suffer from alienation, if nothing else. The real cause of all of our suffering is the second noble truth. We suffer because we want things. We have cravings and clingings for things. We both want material things, actual tangible things. You want more money. You want a newer car. You want a bigger house. You want more toys. You want more food. All sorts of different examples. You crave for ideas of self, for being, status, career, family. You want people to look at you and marvel at you. There's also occasionally even craving for non-being, that you want to be alone. Leave me alone. You want some forms of suicide. We'll take an, an exact form of this as well. Maybe a bit extreme, but it's there. Some people also cling to rules, right? This is the way things have to be. Here's the rules and you're following and the rules and you're breaking the rules and, and therefore that's gonna divide that in one way or the other. In many ways, the thing that we cling to the most is the notion of self. And this is the hardest idea for Westerners to really grasp. This doctrine of anatta, or if you prefer the Sanskrit, anatman. There is no I, there is no self, there is no soul that exists within Buddhism. There is only the rest of the karmic residue that needs to move from one life to another because you're not equal. I liken this usually to flames, right? One candle can light another candle, and none of us would say that that second flame is the same as the first flame. The heat that exists out of that first one causes the second flame to light, but when the heat leaves that first one, if you blow out the first candle, the second candle still remains lit. It was never the same as the first one, but it was caused by that first one. And then this is the same notion that we will find within the somewhat idea of selfhood within Buddhism. There is no real self, there is no permanent I, there is no soul. Therefore, there is no reincarnation, but only rebirth. The fact that karma has not been equalized means that that has to go somewhere. 
There has to be an effect to the cause until it is flattened out. The waves on the shore keep moving and keep arriving until all is still. And as long as there's not stillness, there needs to be another candle lit, another cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. But it's not you, it's not an I, it's not a self. What we're wanting is to get an equal lines on the karmic equation, where your good and your bad are done. There's not too much push and not too much pull. Good actions, generally for Buddhism in the most generic sense, produce good karma and bad actions, bad karma. The theory of karma is a theory of cause and effect. It's existent like gravity. It's a natural force of the universe. It's a natural law that has nothing to do with justice or reward or punishment. It's just like gravity doesn't care if it's helping or hurting. Karma is the same thing. Now, it's said that an arhat, an enlightened being, does not produce karma because he doesn't have the idea of self, and therefore there is no longer any rebirth. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, I've heard of, you know, reborn uh, bodhisattvas who are also enlightened beings. How does that work? And the answer is we're starting to move into different variances of Buddhism and different teachings and different arguments. So that's its own long conversation to have. But the general rule is that it doesn't. What we're really seeking after is the notion of Naroda, the cessation of dukkha, the end of suffering. Suffering will end when these attachments are ended. This is the extermination of thirst, the absence of desire, the ultimate, the absolute, the annihilation of the perception of self. This is not a Christian or even seek notion of heaven where there's a God and a self that's going to unify within God. Rather, this is moksha, this is liberation from the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, that it is obtained in this life and is present now and, and moves forward. There is neither perception nor non-perception, neither nothingness nor somethingness. You are there, but there is no you because there is no self. There is not the result of anything, of any actions. It's neither cause nor effect. It's seen as the truth. Now, what's the difference between moksha, the liberation from cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, and nirvana? The answer is pretty much the same, but one smells of teen spirit. Or, more precisely, nibbana is the Pali to moksha, the Sanskrit. But, you know, I like the other thing more. I like my joke. I, I'm going to keep using it regardless of, of what happens because sometimes you tell jokes for yourself. The way to get there is known as Maga, the path. The way to attain enlightenment is to follow the eightfold path as set forward. Neither asceticism nor the pleasures of sense or philosophical wisdom. It's this middle path that's going to be done. The Eightfold Path is broken up into three different sections. We have the Pana, those dealing with wisdom, right view and right thought. Sila, your rules of morality, right speech, actions, and livelihood. And Samadhi, uh, right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. We really need to look at the Eightfold Path, not as a 12-step program with a handful of less steps, but rather as spokes to a wheel. This is usually the way that it's depicted as in this wheel. And the idea is that you're going to be working on all of them at the same time. It's not move on from one to the other, but you slowly build out the strength of each of these spokes until the wheel can turn. The first of these spokes that we will address is right view. This is understanding the way that the universe is. From the Buddhist perspective, it's very clear. It's the Four Noble Truths. It's the Eightfold Path, of which this is the first one. It's also acknowledging that there is no self, that there is no God, and there is no grace, that you must do everything on your own, that you are stuck in the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. And the best thing is to leave this cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, not simply improve the next life. 
The second is right thought. This would be thoughts of renunciation, detachment, nonviolence, and love. Right speech includes keep from lying, no slander, don't have talk that could bring about hatred, disunity, disharmony, no harsh or rude speech, no gossip, don't speak too carelessly. And this might be why some of you think of the monks just always being quiet because you can't say the wrong thing if you don't say anything. Right action is the next, and this includes the five precepts. I know it seems like we're doing a math equation at this point. In the Four Noble Truths, we have the Eightfold Path, and in that, we have the five precepts. Yes, I know. These are don't steal, don't lie. Technically, this doesn't belong in speech because it's don't deal dishonestly, don't have unfair or lying scales, don't kill. This is why Buddhists should be vegetarians. Don't take intoxicants, and don't engage in sexual misconduct. Right livelihood naturally follows the right action. Generally, the idea of right livelihood is you shouldn't make a living in any way that can harm any living thing. You can't become a butcher or a soldier or a bartender or a waiter or a waitress if you're serving alcoholic drinks. You shouldn't have any profession where you're responsible for making life and death decisions or will affect or profit off of any of those things that violate those right actions. You need to be consistent with that as well. Right efforts, this is your will. You need to avoid unwholesome states of mind and seek to foster good states of mind. Make sure you're thinking about things which are noble and true, that you're putting your energies into things that are going to be productive. Right mindfulness, this is also sometimes identified as right attentiveness. Here it's the idea of being attentive of what's going on in your body. How many of you are aware of your breathing? How often do you breathe? It's argued by some that the whole of Indian philosophy was generated off the idea of breath control. But you breathe different if you're being chased by a tiger than you do if you're sitting still and listening to a lecture. Why is that any different? How many of you are mindful of your pulse? Is that also so erratic? You should control your body and be aware of what your body is doing. Because if you're not aware of what your body is doing, how could you be aware of those things outside of it? Right concentration. This is where your mind is trained upon that which is noble and true. I might have some of you kinesiology students and others going, well, of course you have to breathe more when you're running. That's just the nature, right? You're concentrating on the wrong thing. The idea is to know what's going on with your body and control it, not to critique the ideas. Why are you concentrating on the negative, on the bad? The idea behind all of this is that this is simply a raft. This is to help you to get from one side to another. And once you've made it to the furthest shore, there's no reason to carry it with you. Buddhism is really a tool for you to be able to move from one place to another, to attain enlightenment, to end the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. As such, there's no faith attached within Buddhism. It would be incomplete to ever say the Buddhist faith argues X, Y, and Z, or in the Buddhist faith, blah, 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 because there is no Buddhist faith. There is no place for faith in Buddhism. Faith is, requires a, a leap, an intellectual ascent to another idea. It requires some higher power which exists either inside or outside of yourself. Buddhism doesn't have that. Instead, what Buddhism has is known as the three refuges, occasionally referred to as jewels, although that confuses things some if you want to study that longer. In Buddhism, you're going to have the three refuges. The first is that you take refuge in the Buddha. The fact that the Buddha was a man just like any other man, you take refuge in him. You don't have faith in him. He could have been a liar. But he says he's a man like any other man, and he says he attained enlightenment, that he ended the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. And as a man, nothing special, uh, he provides the archetype for us to be able to do the same.
as well. That if we follow his instruction, his life, that we know we can do it as well. Now, Buddhism even has a saying, if you see the Buddha kill him, which is a rather shocking saying, you wouldn't find this within any other sort of tradition because everyone else would value their saints, their heroes. And Buddhism says, no, we have to undervalue him. We have to recognize he's not special, that he's just a man. And I take refuge that he's just a man like any other man. Next is I will take refuge in the Dharma. Here the Dharma is not the broad notion of duty based upon Varna that you would find within Hinduism, but rather the idea of Dharma here is the teachings of the Buddha, that a man, like any other man, wrote down, taught, etc., and that these teachings can provide a way for me to attain enlightenment as well. And finally, I take refuge in the Sangha, the community of monks and nuns, the group of men and women who are also undergoing this process, who are attaining enlightenment from occasion, and that I, too, can be like them, that I can see ordinary people achieving extraordinary things, natural things, ending the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. And so you don't have faith in any of these. You take refuge in them. This is a shelter from those waves that are pounding on you. The greatest teaching from Siddhartha Gautama is what's known as the Fire Sermon. The Fire Sermon is, is given that name because we're talking about fire, and in many ways it corresponds in importance to the Sermon on the Mount for Christianity. He begins with Bukhis, uh, all is burning. What is the all that is burning? The eye is burning, visible forms are burning, visual consciousness is burning, visual impression is burning. Also whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, arises on account of the visual impression, and that too is burning. Burning with what? What is it that's causing this burning? It's burning with the fire of lust, the fire of hate, the fire of delusion. I say it's burning with birth and aging and death, with sorrows, with lamentations, with pains, with griefs, and with despairs. Everything around us is burning from the fire of lust, hate, and delusion. Now notice here what we have, the three poisons, once again, right? Desire, hatred, ignorance, lust, hate, and delusion. What's causing us to suffer, what's causing us to burn are these poisons that we need to evade. And this fire sermon is the opportunity to get these out of our life. The ear is burning, he continues on. Sounds are burning, auditory consciousness is burning, auditory impression is burning, also whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, nor neither pleasant nor painful, arises on account of the auditory impression, that too is burning. Burning with what? With the fire of lust, with the fire of hate, with the fire of delusion. Once again, we have the, our ears are burning, right? How many of you wait to hear a good word about you, for your pride to be puffed up, or a bad word about somebody you don't like? Or something that you just know isn't true, but it, it, it's ex and exciting in some way. But your ears are burning in these as well. The nose is burning. Odors are burning. Olfactory consciousness is burning. Olfactory impression is burning. Whatsoever sensation, pleasant or painful, or neither pleasant or painful, arises on the account of the olfactory impression. That too is burning. Burning with what? The fire of lust. The fire of hate. The fire of delusion. You want to smell good things. You want to smell pleasantness. You want your senses to take in something enticing. But that too is lust and delusion. The tongue is burning. Flavors are burning. Just state of consciousness is burning. Just state of impression is burning. Also, whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, and either pleasant or painful arises on account of just state of impression, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust fire of hate, the fire of delusion. You're a bunch of flavor chasers. You want to taste something good. You want to eat something that's pleasant. You want your bellies to be full. This is somewhat natural, just animal and base maybe, but you're wanting something exquisite too. Right? This is lust. You're wanting more than you should have. You're wanting to be diluted into something being extra important. You may even have 
hatred of somebody else wrapped up in that. Hopefully not. But right, this becomes all wrapped up within these ideas. The body is burning. Tangible things are burning. Tactile consciousness is burning. Tactile impression is burning. Whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, neither pleasant nor painful, arises on account of the tactile sensation. That too is burning. Burning with what? The fire of lust, hate, delusion. Our bodies are burning. We are destroying ourselves because we're wanting more. We're wanting good sensations and we're chasing after the positive in our minds, the pleasing the enticing, and not what's truly good. The mind is burning. Mental objects are burning. Mental consciousness is burning. Mental impressions is burning. Also, whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, neither pleasant nor painful, arises on account of the mental impression. That, too, is burning. Burning with what? The fire of lust, that of hate. The fire of delusion. I say burning with birth along with death with sorrows and lamentations and pains and griefs and despairs how much of our time do we spend thinking about what we want about who we hate about delusional things that we know aren't true so what is it we should do how do we end our mind nose eyes tongue ears burning how do we set ourselves right? Said, listen, noble disciple, who sees things thus becomes dispassionate with regard to the eye, becomes dispassionate with regard to visible forms, becomes dispassionate to the regard of visual consciousness, becomes dispassionate with regard to visual impression. And whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, neither pleasant nor painful, arises on the account of the visual impression with regard to that, he too becomes dispassionate becomes dispassionate with regard to the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, becomes dispassionate with mental objects, becomes dispassionate with regard to mental consciousness, becomes dispassionate with regard to mental impression, and also whatever sensation, pleasant or painful, neither pleasant nor painful, arises on the account of mental impressions with regards that too he becomes dispassionate. The argument for, from Buddha is that you should be dispassionate to everything, no longer care, no longer put yourself into it, no longer desire, no longer hate. This is what you're supposed to do. This is the way that you go past always wanting to hear a good thing or smell a good thought or see something beautiful, is to not care one way or the other. He says that being dispassionate, you become detached. Through detachment, you are liberated. When you are liberated, there is knowledge that you are indeed liberated. And you know that your birth is exhausted and your life has been lived. What has been done is done and there's no more left to be done. This is what you need to do. So you need to be dispassionate so you can be detached from everything around you and liberated from these concerns. This is the solution for Buddhism. There's also what's known as the parable of the piece of cloth, which adds to this. In it, the Buddha asks, if a soiled and dirty piece of cloth is dipped into by the fuller in a dye at all, will it still be a bad and dirty color? Yes, why? Because it's not clean. It's dirty. Even so, he says, when the mind is impure, a bad future must be expected. Now, conversely, if a perfectly clean piece of cloth is dipped into the dye, will it be beautiful and clean in color? Yes. Well, why? Because it's clean. Even so, if your mind is pure, a good future life must be expected. You need to purify your mind and your desires and all of the rest of it then will become clean afterwards. So what are the mind's impurities? What do we need to get rid of? Well, there's a, a whole host of things that are listed out, right? You need to recognize an impurity of the mind and abandon it, be it pride or jealousy or anger. If it's deceit, whatever it is that's making you think 
something that isn't the case. It's an impurity and it needs to get, be gotten rid of. This becomes the next thing you need to do. You need to cleanse your mind from the impurities that you have. So that way you can be clean after you are died, after you are immersed in this. Otherwise, you still hold on to that stain. This is the result when you have abandoned these things, recognizing it as an impurity of the mind, you will find serene joy, satisfaction, and the enlightenment. The Blessed One, he says, is worthy, perfectly enlightened, endowed with knowledge and virtue, happy, knower of words, matchless tamer of men, teacher of gods and men, awakened and blessed. He finds serene joy in the Dharma and in the Sangha. Right? If indeed you're able to cleanse yourself of this, you will take refuge and joy in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the three refuges. You have serenity of mind and joy moving forward because you are not wrapped up with notions of rancor or hypocrisy. There's no arrogance or haughtiness anymore, and that's going to allow you to be joyous. touched by the feeling of the sense and the truth, and he receives the gladness associated with the truth. When one is glad, joy arises, and when the mind is joyful, he bodily becomes relaxed, and when relaxed, he feels content, and the mind of the contented man is concentrated. When you're touched by the truth, eventually, you'll be content. You'll be able to concentrate on noble things and you'll be able to focus on that truth. There will be no impediments in your way. Just as a soiled dirty cloth plunged into clear water becomes pure and clean, or as gold passed through the furnace becomes pure and clean, even so those who reach this state in virtue, in mental discipline and in wisdom may partake of the choicest rice with all manner of sauces and curries, and it will not be an impediment or harm to them or to this spiritual life. There is this, there is a lower, and there is yet a higher stage. Deliverance lies beyond this realm. You need to be bathed internally. You need to be clean. Your mind needs to cleanse every other thought. Birth is also exhausted. The holy life has been lived what else has to be done? There's no more to be done on this account. So once you've cleared yourself out of all of these impediments, once you don't desire anything, if you have those good luxury things, it's of no avail, it's of no account. You've cleansed yourself, you've bathed yourself, and your birth has been exhausted. There will be no more birth. This will be your last birth. I would encourage all of you to go watch or read one of the Jataka tales, the, the tale of the golden elephant, and the idea about how desire just causes more and more desire and eventually your own downfall while mediating these will help you succeed and flourish in life. So what has this section told us? What has Buddhism taught us about what's ethical? what constitutes a good life, a life of dispassion, about what the passions are and looking at these three poisons, how to overcome them, and even why we should overcome them. What does succumbing to the passions do in reducing your meaningfulness of life? What has this system told us that we're able to take from it? Do you want to be dispassionate is another great question. Is this something that's good for all the time or just some of the time? And would it work only some of the time? So these are the questions that you should kind of ponder about at this time.